kunjabi hari talk to you about how Prabhupada always started every lecture with that, with that bhajan. So all glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to the assembled devotees. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the festival for creating such a wonderful festival every year. It's a great opportunity for us all to see each other again after so many, sometimes decades. And it's a great opportunity for us to share um, our experiences and memories. So thank you for putting this together. And especially I'd like to thank um, Nishtraganya, I mean, excuse me, Nishringananda Das and Patrikananda Das who invited me to speak today. Sure. They're the best. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of my memories and realizations and experiences with Srila Prabhupada. And it's a great honor, and I'm humbled by being asked to speak today. Thank you. Um, on a personal note, uh, sometimes I find it unfortunate that in many places in this world, and even at times in our own society, the contributions of women are minimized, and their potential stifled. But my experience with Srila Prabhupada was quite different. He would always encourage me to be my best self, he always expected me to do whatever was needed, even if 
I had never done it before. He expected me to figure out how to do it. Never presented any limitations or discrimination that I was a female or in a female body. Um, and through his example, he taught me many what I like to call life lessons, which are a wellspring of inspiration for me every, every day of my life. So, as any devotee who's spent time with Srila Prabhupada knows what an incredibly powerful and incredibly fearless presence he was. His power, his effulgence, his presence was so strong that it was unmistakable. However, what I want to talk about is how kind and how affectionate and how funny he was. Um, because these are qualities that I think not a lot of people experienced, but he would often teach us, and as I look back, I'm amazed at how often he would teach with kindness, with compassion, and with humor. He had a great sense of humor. It was very wry, very witty, and he would always tease me. And, and so I have a lot of experiences with him where he was very, very funny. So I'd like to begin, actually, to, to talk to you about the way I first met Srila Prabhupada. I was 17, and I'd been reading the Bhagavad Gita since I was 14 years old. Um, I was drawn to it. And the Bhagavad Gita I had was from um, the Ramakrishna Mission, which has been around in the United States for even longer than our movement. So the book was my constant companion. I took it everywhere I went. And as my desire for self-realization grew, I felt that what I needed most was to go out into nature and meditate and be away from all people. So off I went to Hawaii seeking answers to the great, you know, life's big questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What is the meaning of life? So I set up a tent on the beach on the north shore of Oahu. And I was living on the fruits of the land when through the most mystical of experiences, Prabhupada entered my life. This was March 1969. And while I was meditating on the beach, carried by the breeze of the ocean, a flyer landed on my leg. Came to rest there and I picked it up and I looked at it and it announced that an Indian guru, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, would be speaking on the Bhagavad Gita at Sunset Point. So I was very excited. I thought, this is like the universe sending me a message. Because what I had been studying for years now, Bhagavad Gita, I was going to actually meet a real Indian Swami that was going to teach me about the Bhagavad Gita. So I went to see what he had to say, and of course, it was love at first sight. Um, after his talk, Prabhupada asked for questions, and, and I asked him about my Bhagavad Gita, and he took the book and he looked at it, and then invited me to come back to their apartment um, in Oahu. And I know that Rameshwar mentioned earlier they had a house well, it was the world's tiniest house because we, I rode back to, with, with Govinda Dasi Gorsundar and Kartikeya, the, the only three that were there, in the back of a truck. And, um, and when we got there, it was this tiny little place with two rooms, one room for Prabhupada, one room for Govinda Dasi and Gorsundar who were married, and, then, and Kartikeya slept in the living room. Anyway, so he invited me into his room, we sat and we talked for a long, long time. I immediately knew I was in the presence of a great soul. It was so <coughs> obvious. His, his compassion, his love, his charm, his warm personality, everything about him made me comfortable. I felt like I wanted to be with him forever. And it was this very open and honest exchange between the two of us. I felt like I could tell him anything. So we talked about everything. And he showed me his new book, and I was just talking to Shama Sinder about it showed me his Bhagavad Gita, which had just been published at the time, and it was the one with the purple cover, and Shama Sinder told me it's a, it was actually a prototype from Macmillan, and it was purple, and there was a drawing of, of Radha Krishna on the front cover, kind of a stylized drawing. And he showed me that, and then he said, he quoted a few verses from his Gita, then he asked me to, for my Gita, and I gave it to him. 
And he compared the verses and he said, mine is better. <laughs> <laughs> so then he showed me this record album. And I don't know if any of you experienced it. I'm, the older devotees probably have. He had, a, he, had, he had put out a record album of chanting Hare Krishna. And I told him, oh, I've seen that record album because I used to take LSD and listen to that album. And, um, and I would experience Krishna. And I took LSD as a sacrament. I told him, trying, trying for self-realization. And I said, you know, I would see Krishna on my, on my psychedelic trips. And instead of being judgmental or um, in any way condemning of my activities, he was actually very concerned. He, he acted like, oh my god, this young girl taking LSD. It was like amazing to him. He was shocked. And in retrospect, you know, as years went on, Prabhupada used to say to people, I found her in a most pitiable condition. <laughs> so I knew, he, I didn't know that at the time, so he was concerned. He said, it is not the LSD. You see Krishna because Krishna loves you and shows favor upon you. This is why you see him. And promise me you will not take that anymore. And I said, well, I can't really promise you at this time, but I eventually did. And by the way, on a footnote on that, when Prabhupada gave me my initiation, first initiation, he gave me a fifth regulative principle. You know, he said, four regulative principles, and he said, as he's handing me my beads back, and no LSD. <laughs> <laughs> Tamal reminded me of that a couple, many, many, many times. He thought it was hilarious. I was initiated here in Los Angeles. We weren't here. We were at the other temple, which was on um, La Cienica. And Prabhupada used to come. Anyway, so I'm jumping ahead. I'll go back. So during my visit in Hawaii, Govinda Dasi brought in a tray of sugar cane for Srila Prabhupada to have. And he offered to share the sweet stocks with me. And then he taught me how to chew on the canes. I, at first I said, no, I don't eat sugar. You know, I was a hippie, so I didn't eat sugar. Um, but he taught me how to chew on the canes and suck out the juice and then discard the tough pulp. And I realized now, in retrospect, that was his first life lesson to me, to always suck out the juice of life and throw away the pulp. So. When it came time for me to leave, Prabhupada said he wished I could stay, but then he explained to me that there was one room for Govinda Dasi for Sundar and another room for him, and that Kartikeya was sleeping on the couch, but he, he was very concerned and didn't, you know, want me to leave, but I, I left. So I knew right after meeting him that he was the spiritual master teacher I'd been looking for. And the interesting thing about that is that for some reason, in this long conversation that I had with Srila Prabhupada in his room, he never once mentioned that there was a Hare Krishna movement. For me, it was just I met this Indian Swami in Hawaii. So it was like I didn't make a connection. So I didn't really know there was a Hare Krishna movement. And, um, but then I called a friend of mine, Susan, who, by the way, became Palika Devi Dasi, um, who was in Laguna Beach. And she said, oh, you know what? I told her about the Swami that I had met, and she said, he has a temple in Los Angeles, and several of our friends are considering moving in. I went, really? That's amazing. So a few months later, I flew back to Los Angeles, and I was picked up at the airport by um, Dayananda. Um, I think he was the president at the time. And it was only a few weeks after I arrived in Los Angeles that I met Prabhupada again. And we, as I mentioned, we were at La Cienica, and we used to line up on the pathway. There was a, like a pathway in front of the temple, and we would line up, kneeling along the pathway as Prabhupada arrived, and he would pat us all on the head as he went by. And so he patted me on the head, and I looked up, and he goes, I met you in Hawaii. <laughs> Even though I was wearing a sari and tilak, he recognized me immediately. He said, I am glad you've come. So that's how I met Prabhupada. And then in October 1970, I was asked to join a small group of devotees to, that were going to India with Sri Prabhupada. Um, when we landed, I felt like I had landed home again. It was really amazing. And there are so many 
amazing stories of those early days in India. And I was very blessed to spend so much time with Srila Prabhupada. But he called our little group the World Sankirtan Party. We were his white dancing elephants. And so at first there was only five women in the group. There was Yamuna, Malati, along with her daughter, and Shamsundar's daughter, Saraswati, and Himavati, and um, Madhi. And so Prabhupada was very protective of us because there were so few ladies. Um, and he would always make sure that we were looked after, that we had a place to stay, that we were in a car with him if he was going by himself and the girls were with him. And so shortly after we arrived in Bombay, Sri Prabhupada was invited to speak at a spiritual gathering in Amritsar called the All India Vedanta Somalian. And Yamuna and I were the only two women that got to go. So we had a really magical time. It was just the two of us and eight men and Srila Prabhupada. And when we got there, they gave us our rooms. And they were two tiny little rooms facing a courtyard. Um, so Prabhupada decided that he would take one room, Jamuna and I would take the other room, and then the men would stay out on the courtyard. And it was bitterly cold. And the men really suffered. <laughs> Not that I'm laughing because men suffer. Uh, but they, they were very austere compared to us because we had a little room and Prabhupada had a little room. But um, yeah, it, I remember I've spoken to Giriraj about it a lot because he said it was freezing and they were just out there and it was damp and it was winter and it was cold and they had to live on sleeping bags out in this courtyard. It was extremely cold. Um, but the amazing thing about Amritsar for me was, um, I had never really, you know, other than here in Los Angeles leading some kirtans with Vishnu Janan and stuff, these are small gatherings. Um, but in Amritsar, there was thousands of people. And suddenly we were on a stage with thousands of people watching us. And Srila Prabhupada would say, you lead kirtan. And it was so frightening because we'd never done that before. So going back to what I was saying when I started this talk, is that without limitations, he presented us these challenges. And he expected us to rise to the occasion on all situations. And there was never any, um, there was never any expectation of, I can't do it. He just said, you, do it. And then we would just do it because we loved him, and that's all that mattered to please him. So we put ourselves out there, and Yamuna would lead kirtan, sometimes I would lead kirtan, we'd sing bhajans. Yamuna actually lectured once. She told me she was terrified. Um, and, you know, it was very terrifying, but he always would encourage us. And then one, once when we were criticized, there was actually one time in Amritsar that a man in the audience a lot of this was in Hindi, so I mean, we had just arrived in India and they were talking Hindi and we didn't know what was going on. So, a man in the audience criticized Yamuna and I for our imperfect Sanskrit pronunciation. And so Prabhupada was furious and he replied in, in English so we could understand what he was saying. These girls have more devotion than you will ever know in a million lifetimes. <laughs> So he said, it doesn't matter that they can't say the words perfectly. It's just like what, uh, you know, Rameshwar was talking about with the paintings. It almost doesn't matter if it's perfect. It matters if there's love. It matters if there's devotion. So when we were in Amritsar, we were invited to visit the Golden Temple, which is the holiest site of the Sikh religion. And Prabhupada graciously accepted, and we all went. Um, and the thing I learned from that experience was how respectful and, and compassionate and non-judgmental he was. Um, he was very impressed by the spiritual mood of the temple. They took us to the inner, where the Guru Granth Sahib is, and they took us there, and he was very respectful. There was chanting going on all the time. And they had these giant, they had a community kitchen where they feed like 100,000 visitors a day. And Prabhupada was very, very impressed by their food operation. So we went into the community kitchen and they had this giant, giant walk 
And I can't count how many times he said, and the walk was like, I don't, there's actually probably an accurate name for it, but it looked like a giant upside down walk with fire underneath. And they had these giant paddles where they were flipping rotis by the thousands. And they were feeding like, I think, I think they average 100,000 or more people per day, pilgrims from all religions, from all races, they come. Prabhupada was very impressed, and he kept saying, we should do that, we should do that. And um, so when we left the Golden Temple, they asked Srila Prabhupada to write in their guest book. And I remember he had us gather around to see what he would write. We're all peeking over his shoulder, and he writes under comments, very spiritual. And then they ask, you know, and he signs his name, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, with that amazing signature. And then under religion, he wrote, Krishnite. And he looked at all of us and he went, Krishnite. <laughs> <laughs> so we took the Punjab mail back to Bombay, and it was a real rickety, real rough ride. And we were all in third class, and except Gurudas, wherever you are, was in first class with Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> so, Yamuna and I decided, well, why don't we go find out if Prabhupada needs anything? Because we wanted to get out of this like smoke-filled, really uncomfortable, hard-as-rock bench seats in third class. We thought, let's go to the first class cabin and find out what's going on up there. So, um, we made our way into their cabin, and Yamuna asked if there was anything that Prabhupada wanted. And he said, can you cook me some hot rice? And we said, yes. <laughs> Even though we had no idea how we would cook him hot rice on this rickety little train heading from, um, you know, from Amritsar down to Bombay. And so we, we left, we paid our obeisances, we left, and we went, oh, God, how are we going to do this? So we wandered through the train till we found an official and, and, and insisted that they let us cook rice. And he said, no, absolutely not, no, can't use our kitchen. And Yamuna said, well, then I might as well throw myself off this train. <laughs> <laughs> and she was serious. I mean, I don't think she really would have done it, but I mean, she was so serious to him that he believed it. And he went, crazy American woman. And then, and then he decided to send us off to this like little sub kitchen where it was filthy. I mean, you have no idea how filthy it was. Filthy, filthy, filthy. Black, black pots, black everything. So we scrubbed and cleaned as much as we could. And um, we scrubbed this big nasty looking aluminum pot and cooked on a coal stove. And Yamuna was so expert, she was such an amazing cook, that even in those conditions she made sublime rice. So it was a big pile of tali of, of white rice, basmati rice, and we carried the platter to Srila Prabhupada's cabin. And he was delighted. He, he, his eyes got big, he was so excited, and he just sat there and ate with his fingers this, this rice. And um, we stayed. And Yamuna and I talked about it over the years, and, and, and we wondered, you know, did he really want rice, or was he actually just testing our determination and commitment to achieve what was seemingly unachievable? Again, it was the theme of my talk today, which is no limitations. He, he, he gave us a task, and he expected us to achieve it. He didn't tell us how to achieve it, he just thought, you, go figure it out. And that was one of the great lessons that I take with me through my life today. Anything can be achieved because if you put your mind to it, you can do it. So there was this Indian man that joined them on the train and, and he invited the devotees to come to Delhi and Sri Prabhupada asked Gurudas to pick the devotees that he wanted to um, join him in Delhi. They were going to get off the train in Delhi. Again, get off the train, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so, we, we were on our way to Bombay. This was like in the, the, there was no plans, right? So, 
Yeah, it was just spontaneous. So Prabhupada said, get, you know, yeah. Guru Das, you will get off the train and pick who you want to take with you. So Guru Das has told me, I didn't know this until he told me, but that he asked me to come since Jamuna and I were, had become such good friends. And Prabhupada said, no, I have other plans for her. But I'm still waiting with, for what those plans are. <laughs> I don't know what they are. Anyway, so I was heartbroken because Yamuna got off the train and she had become my best friend and closest confidant and a spiritual teacher to me as well. And so suddenly I was alone in Bombay. Malati was there, which was awesome. But we moved into uh, a Sita Ram temple. And Shamsundu, you were there, right? Yeah. So every day at the Sita Ram temple, Prabhupada would have um, people come and speak to him, and, and we would sit with him, and, and oftentimes it was in Hindi, so we had no idea what was being said. But we would sit and listen, and we'd wait in case Prabhupada needed something, we'd be there attentive, and in case he wanted us to get him something or bring something. We'd just sit there and we'd listen, even if it was in Hindi and we couldn't understand a word that was being said. So, one of these visits has stayed with me um, for all these decades. And that is, I remember this Indian gentleman came in, he prostrated himself in front of Srila Prabhupada, and he said, Swamiji, you will save me. And Prabhupada said, I cannot save you, but I can teach you how you can save yourself. But you must do the work. And that was a life lesson for me in personal responsibility. Everything we do, we must be responsible. We must do the work. If it's self-realization, if it's anything in life, nobody can hand it to you. You must do the work. So after Bombay, we went to Surat. And we were guests of an incredibly wonderful, generous, kind gentleman named Bhagavad Jariwala. He was a very rich man and had a very large home. And we invaded his home thoroughly. <laughs> but his family was very gracious and they were very kind. And the whole city opened itself up to us. It was Incredible, because they would publish our route on the, um, in the paper or in some flyers, and the, the ladies of the city would put saris across the route so that it would shade us, and they would come, and they would put garland after garland after garland until they were so high we'd have to take them off. And they would put sandalwood paste on our forehead to cool us off as we were dancing through the streets. It was Amazing. It was like the city was the center of the spiritual universe and Prabhupada was the center of that. And everyone wanted to see him. And we would set up big, you know, platforms in the middle of streets. Whole streets would be closed down. And they would come and listen. And it was endless hours of darshan at the house. Tireless. I mean, I was 19 at the time. Just turned 19. And I was exhausted. I, I mean, I, I could not, he had, Prabhupada had so much boundless energy that it was, you didn't know where it was coming from. I mean, it was obviously coming from Krishna, but it was like, like all, he was wearing all of us out and we were in our, you know, 20s and early teen, or in teens. So it was pretty intense. He would speak and speak and speak and go, engagement to engagement, and go from home to home. Um, and he'd do all throughout, city, all throughout the city and all the surrounding villages. So on one of these um, village engagements, after his lecture, Prabhupada motioned to me to come to him. He'd go, this is how he would do it. Come, Koshalya. I walked up to him, leaned in. He said, Koshalya, sing Sri Sopanishad. Now, the reason he did that is because that earlier in, you know, day, a few days ago, a few days sooner, I had told him I had learned all of the slokas of Sri Yashopanishad. So he remembered that. And at first I was very, very nervous. 
And I started chanting Om Purnam Adha Purnam Dham, singing all the verses. Prabhupada watched me, and as I watched him, I felt the strength, because he would give us his strength, even when we were not there. Um, and, and he kept me from falling apart, because this was like a little tiny experience. And he was beaming with pride, and, and you know when Prabhupada sang, smiled, he would light up a room, so it was like that. And when I finished singing, he called me over to him and I started to pay my obeisances and it reminded me a lot of what Madhavisa was saying. He grabbed my head and pulled it down to him and then he patted me on the head. <laughs> I felt like a puppy dog. <laughs> it was the closest, most, um, you know, other than those pats on the head in Los Angeles Temple, but he actually like pulled me down to him, so it was really amazing. And a very special moment, I'll never forget. But the lessons that I learned in Surat were really the kindness and generosity of strangers. Um, Mr. Bhagavai Jariwala and all of his family were so good to us. The people in that city were so good to us. It was just, we were undeserving, but they were so open, spiritual, genuine, loving, generous. Perfect strangers would walk up to us as we were walking down, chanting down the street in Sankirtan and pull us into their homes and feed us bananas or hot milk or, you know, just, it was, it was amazing. It was, wasn't it? These guys were here. They were here. They were there. So, um... After Allahabad, after, after Surat, we went to Allahabad, the Kumbh Mela, in January of 1971. So we hadn't been in India that long. I mean, we came in October of 1970, and by 71, we were going to the Kumbh Mela. And I don't know if any of you have been to the Kumbh Mela, but it is incredible. The biggest gathering of humanity probably on the planet. Um, millions of people, millions. And we had a little tent. We had our little pondle set up. And it's, Kumbh Mela takes place at the confluence of three sacred rivers, the Ganga, the Yamuna, and the Saraswati. And Prabhupada taught us when we first arrived that we should disrespect no yogis because many of these yogis, he said, are hundreds, if not thousands of years old. And many of these yogis have come from the Himalaya and they come under the water and they come up here to the Kumbh Mela. And so, because it, it was very important to him that we didn't disrespect, because everybody there was so weird to us. Even though we had been in India, never had we seen naked sadhus with padlocks on their genitals, covered in ash, matted hair, tridents. It, it, was, a wild, it was a wild scene. And so he was very, very, wanted us to be respectful. We lived in tents. And I remember he said, um, so we just come from the home of Mr. Bhagavad Jariwala, and we live in a palace, and now we're living in tents. And we would pump our water, and it was freezing cold, and we lived basically in squalor. It was very, very difficult conditions. And he said, but devotees, we are devotees, so we don't care. Palace, tents, it's all the same to us. <laughs> but... Um, Yamuna and I used to take long walks every morning, like around 2.30 in the morning, um, to the Ganga, to the Triveni, where the confluence of the rivers. And you have to take this long walk, take a boat ride, then you'd get out and you'd, and you'd get in the river. And you'd walk into the river and there's this place where nectar is dropped. And there's a time when that nectar is dropped. So one day we were there bathing, we were chanting Gayatri, and we were chanting Sri Sopanishad, and we were very, very, you know, feeling very deeply spiritual. And suddenly over the bullhorn comes this shout, the saints are coming, the saints are coming. <laughs> and so we look up the hill, and, and there's this 
avalanche of humanity coming down the hill, running towards the river at that moment, carrying tridents, ash-covered, naked men, and we're thinking, this, we, we better get out of here. <laughs> so we, we got out as, you've never seen two people move quite that fast. It was very scary, but it was, it was a funny, one of the funniest things that I've ever experienced. But um, after that, Prabhupada was invited to go to Gorakhpur. His first books were published by Hanuman Prasad Bhodar, who was the fellow from Gita Press. And so we, we went there, and we actually started, when we first arrived in Gorakhpur, we were staying at his home. Um, and his home was small, not like Mr. Jari Wallace. And so we were very, very cramped quarters. It was very tight. And I don't remember exactly how it happened, but somehow some of my Joppa beads had broken over the years. And I had gotten a new pair of Joppa beads, but Prabhupada hadn't chanted on them. So I was very concerned that they weren't perfect. Um, they hadn't been chanted on by Srila Prabhupada, so they weren't perfect. They weren't sanctified. So I had mentioned to him, Prabhupada, would you chant on my Japa beads? Yes, I will, one of these times. And I would bug him a few more times. And finally, he said, give them to me. So I gave them to him. And then days went by, and I would say, Srila Prabhupada, have you chanted on my Japa beads? And he would say, not yet. So, <laughs> so I was in great anxiety because I wanted him to chant on my beads. And in this little house, Prabhupada had a room, and there was a, like just a piece of cloth covering the, uh, the, the door. It wasn't an actual physical door, it was just a piece of cloth. And he would take, a, uh, take rest after, um, in the afternoon. So I, I was looking, timing, I'm thinking, okay, he's probably awake, I should check in and see if he's chanted on my beads. I'm sure I was becoming a pest by this time. So, I peek in, I pull the curtain back, and I look around, and he's lying down in his bed with my beads all wrapped around his hands on his side. And the minute I, I mean, I made no noise at all, just a curtain, peeked around the corner, immediately his eyes opened, and he went, Koshalya, you may have your beads now. <laughs> so I walked in. It was very exciting because I still have those beads and Prabhupada slept with them. Wow. So. Anyway, so after a little while, um, you know, we were in such cramped quarters that they decided that we should move to this farm. And they gave us this farm um, in Barakpur to live in. And Prabhupada had been stressing over the fact that the deities that we had installed in, um, in Labat during the Kumbh Mela, his little Radha Krishna deities, um, had been in the trunk the whole time because there was no place to put them in this house. The house was very tight um, and there was no room to put them up. So he was anxious to have them be put up again uh, and installed and worshipped again. He didn't like leaving them in the trunk. So, um, when we got to the farmhouse, uh, Prabhupada said to me, okay, you need to build an altar. Because there was no altar, um, it was a farmhouse. And so I found a table, and, that, and I found a few kind of loose steps, and that was about as far as I had gotten when he came in to check up on me. And so he comes in to check up on me, and he says, where are the others? And I said, I don't know. And he said, bring them. So I went and gathered everybody. And he, he said, I will take over now. So I washed the table, and he put the, put the little steps on the table. And then he said to Himavadi, who was there, you have nice saris, you give Koshalya saris. And she was very like, no. Uh, and, and, then, and then he said, she will take good care of them, won't you? Yes, I will. So we used Himavadi's saris to hang over. Well, before we even got to that, 
Prophet sent Giriraj and I think two other brahmacharis to go pick leaves. Um, we didn't know what he was doing, but he said, go pick leaves, and they went off to pick leaves. So, and then he got Hansadutta, and Hansadutta had to give away one of his fine white dhotis. And he said, Hansadutta, you will give her your dhoti. And, and, and then he asked me to rip it up into strips. So I ripped it into strips, and then he had me stand on the table, and when the guys came back with the, brahmacharis came back with the leaves, he had me put a leaf and a strip of dhoti, a leaf and another strip of dhoti. And just as it went down, wound down these bamboo poles that were tied to the legs of the table, Prabhupada's directing this whole beautiful altar construction. <laughs> so we had leaves, strips of, strips of dhoti, himavadi saris, and we had little pieces from the pondal that I'd saved and kept in the trunk. And he had me put those as a patchwork quilt on the back wall. And then uh, he thought it was perfect. We will have Mangala Arti. And I will teach you a new song. And so he had me write it down and then pass it around to everyone. And that bhajan was Jaya Radha Madhava. And from then on, we always sang Jaya Radha Madhava before any class. Um, but Prabhupada also tasked me to wash the floor because I was kind of the pujari, so I would wash the floor during his lectures. And he would tease me all the time because this it was a long, kind of long room like this with a divider and he was at one end and the temple was at the other end. And so he was here lecturing and the temple was here at this end and I would be on the floor wiping down the floor during his lectures. And he would make all these comments like, Koshalia is a first class devotee, she is washing the floor and you are just sitting here listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would do things like, one time I was washing the floor and he says, Koshalia, come here. And he brings me in and I walk up to him, yes, Srila Prophet, he says, Today, you are washing the floor like a crow takes a bath. <laughs> Do you know how a crow takes a bath? I said, no, I don't. He said, like this. You need to give it more water. I will show you. He got down off the Vyasa sign and walked into the temple room where I was. Where is your bucket? Where is your cloth? And he squatted down onto the floor and he walked. He got me to put it in there and make it very, very wet, wiped it down with lots of water. Then he had me squeeze it out and dried it afterwards. He said, see, that is expert. <laughs> <laughs> so again, teaching with humor. He, um, he just wanted us to always do the best we could. So one morning, and now in Garakpur we had very bad electrical problems. Um, the electricity would constantly go off, so there would be no lights, and I always made sure there was candles by his Vyasa song so he could see um, if the lights went off. So one morning the lights went off and Sri Prabhupada was chanting, Jaya Radha Madhava, leading us, and suddenly it's pitch, back, pitch black in the temple except for the few candles on, you know, on his Vyasa song and a few others. And he stops in the middle, just stops. And it was, you could hear a pin drop. It was, he went into a place of transcendental trance and you could see tears running down his face and nobody was saying or moving a muscle. And it was quiet, but you could hear him crying. And then he said, this is Krishna, just playing in the Vrindavan forest with Srimati Radharani. And then he said, chant Hare Krishna. And it was the most ecstatic kirtan ever after that. And so after that, Srila Prabhupada called those deities Radhamadava from then on. Um, so we went from Garakpur to back to Bombay. And I had fallen very, 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 very ill. And um, my god sisters Yamuna and Himavadi were taking such good care of me.
But I thought I just had amoebic dysentery. I mean, I was really sick. I could barely function. And Srila Prabhupada uh, checked in on me. And I said, this is how cheeky I was. Um, he said, are you all right? And I said, yes, I'm, I'm fine. And he, and he said, what are you eating? And I said, I, I'm not eating anything. And he said, why? Why are you eating nothing? And I said, because Karandar won't give me 50 paisa for dahi. It's the only thing I can eat. And he got so mad at Karandar. No offense to Karandar. <laughs> he, was the, um, he was the treasury guy at the time. And he was very, there was no money, so he was being very cautious. But that was, um, I finally recovered. And when I was in Bombay, two sets of deities arrived from Jayapur. And Prabhupada wanted one of the sets to go to Calcutta, ahead of the Pandal program that we were putting together there. And I was tasked to travel with Radha and Krishna to, on the train to Calcutta. And it turns out when you travel with Radha and Krishna, you get to go first class. <laughs> so it was the, my first experience on a first class train in India. It was a very opulent cabin. And I was riding with wooden box of deities all the way from Bombay to Calcutta. And I started dreaming about white redungas. And I'd never seen a white redunga. They'd never been around. And I guess it's a, it's a Bengali thing. So just before the start of it, when I arrived in Calcutta, we, preparations were happening for the Calcutta Pondal. And when I arrived, Prophet said, you know, in India, usually women don't shouldn't play the mridanga in public. So during the pandal, maybe we shouldn't have women play. And then he glanced at me, and I was looking very disappointed, because in those days, I liked to play the mridanga. And then with a smile, he said, but Koshalya can play, because she would be too upset. <laughs> <laughs> so he constantly broke his own rules. And um, again, teaching through kindness and uh, and in retrospect, I, I actually think he was very progressive for his time. And uh, he was very progressive in his ideas about women and what women could do. Um, and then one time Srila Prabhupada had told me that marble was better than gold to eat off of for plates. So I remembered that, put it in my back pocket, and I had a set made of white marble plates for him. And when he arrived um, at the Calcutta Temple that day, one day, I brought him a plate of fruit on the newly created white marble plates. And he, as I'm paying my obeisances, he says, oh, this is very nice. But these are white marble. And I went, oh my god. In my mind, I'm thinking, oh my god, I, just, I did it wrong. I, I got it all wrong. Oh, no. I'm freaking out inside. Then he smiled at everyone in the room and he said, when I was a boy, my father would use black marble. But now I have so many white fathers, so this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Again, teaching with comedy. He was, he was a great humorist. So one, one other time in, in Calcutta, um, I walked into his room, and he's sitting in the middle of the floor under the ceiling fan. And he had an asan on one end of the room, and then the whole floor was covered with duddies, and um, which are these kind of mattresses on the floor covered in sheets. So he's sitting there under the ceiling fan in the middle of the floor, not on his asana. And I said, Prabhupada, why, why are you sitting on the floor? Can, can I help you? Do you need anything? And he said, oh, mosquitoes have taken my asan. And I said, let me get you a fan. I can blow, blow them away. And he said, no, sit, sit. He said, the floor is very comfortable. And I sat next to him, and he said, you know, we should just go to the bank of the Ganga. We could sit there, chant Hare Krishna, and someone will come along and bring us a japati. Is that all right? <laughs> And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, I'll go get you a fan. <laughs> but um, so many memories. 
Um, so during the India-Pakistan War, we decided to have a Delhi Pandal. And, and this was like in November 1971. And blackouts in those days were mandatory. There were sirens going off and you know, blackouts were mandatory at night because they didn't want to be bombed, which is understandable. But Srila Prabhupada remarked that, you know, he was having trouble translating because he worked at night, he would translate at night, and he couldn't turn on the lights. So we came up with this idea to put black paper on the windows of his room. And so when he came in that night, I switched on the lights and his eyes got big and he went, oh, very nice. He said, now this is an example of first-class intelligence. And then he explained what he meant. He said, first-class intelligence is when you see a problem, and without being asked, you do what is needed. Second-class intelligence is when I tell you a problem that needs to be taken care of, and you do so very nicely. Third-class intelligence is I ask you to do something, you leave the room, and you come back and say, Srila Prabhupada, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> he would often teach with humor. So, shortly after the Delhi Pandal, um, I was sent with one of my god sisters, Srimati, who had come to India um, to buy marble deities for several temples in North America. So, um, I was the seasoned, I mean, November, or December 71, I'd been in India now for a year, so I was the seasoned person, right? Um, only 20, I think, at that time, by that time. Um, and he said, you, Koshali, you go with her to Jaipur and you help her. So we boarded a train to Delhi, from Delhi to Jaipur, and we arrived that evening in Jaipur and checked into a hotel. So the next morning, we were very excited to go to Radha Govindji Devji's temple for Mangalarti. So we did. And we, right after the Mangalarti, we sat in the, there's like a courtyard in front of the deities. And we sat in that courtyard and we started singing bhajans. And a crowd gathered and they listened to us and they asked us questions. Who are you? How do you know so much about Krishna? So we started telling them about Srila Prabhupada. And then P.K. Maharaj, who's the, in charge of the, the Govinda Deji's temple, he introduced himself to us and then invited us to stay at his home with his family as his guest. And we were grateful, but we said, no, we have a hotel already. Um, but he gave us his telephone number in case we needed anything while we were in Jaipur and we needed his assistance or any guidance. And it turned out we really did need his assistance. So, because after we got back to the hotel, we were freshening up in our room, and there was a knock on the door, and it was the police. <laughs> and Srimati had left her passport in Delhi. And so when we checked into the hotel with just one passport, the hotel manager contacted the police. They thought we might be American spies. This was during the, the India-Pakistan War, and America was on the side of Pakistan. So we were not... We were not, we were eyed very suspiciously. Fortunately, we'd already made friends with P.K. Maharaj, and we requested that they contact him, and that he would explain that we're devotees of Krishna, we're not American spies. And so they did call him, and he did say, yes, these girls are devotees, and after speaking to him, they decided to release us in his custody, but, the, but we were not allowed to leave the city until Srimati could present her passport. Are the deities open? No, no, Okay. Um, so we moved into his home and stayed with his family, and since we couldn't leave Jayapur till her passport arrived from Delhi, we decided to do something special with our time. And we made the most of our time there. Every morning we would sing bhajans in front of the temple, and after Mangal Arti at Govinda Deji's temple, and the crowds just kept growing and growing, and we would sing, chant Hare Krishna, we'd sing bhajans, Radha Madhava, we would 
then go and talk about Srila Prabhupada. Soon our gatherings could no longer fit in front of the temple and they put us on the portico. I don't know if any of you have been to Jayapur, but there's a, a reflecting pool in front of Govindaji's temple that leads to City Palace. So there's porticos on either side of the reflecting pool and they fit, they decided we should have our programs there. So it's just the two of us, these two American women, and our little program on the porticos at Govindaji's temple in the City Palace complex. And so I kept saying, if you think what we're saying is interesting, you must meet our guru. You must bring him to Jaipur. And fairly soon after that, everything was arranged. Several pious, wealthy gentlemen agreed to uh, fund the Pandal program. One man paid for the devotees' travel, one man paid for the devotees' accommodations, another paid for their food. And, and so it was all arranged. I made one big mistake that Prabhupada chastised me about, which has always amused me, because Sham Sundar resolved it. Um, I had had banners done that said, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami and his foreign disciples at Govinda Devji's temple on such and such a day. So when Prabhupada saw the banner, he was furious. And I couldn't understand what, what I had done wrong. And he said, American and European, that is the attraction. It is A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami and his American and European disciples. <laughs> and then he, he tasked Shamsundar to get the new banners and they got put up. But I felt bad, but I found out later that he was pleased, very pleased with my work um, in Jayapur. I also convinced P.K. Maharaj to allow Prabhupada to stay in one of the guest houses on the city palace complex, right near Govinda Devji's temple. So Prabhupada was happy, the panda was set up behind Govindaji's temple, and everyone in Jayapur attended. And it, it, was, it was amazing. It was such an amazing success. And by that time, we had purchased the deities for the New York temple, and inspired by Radha Govindji, we decided to do a black Krishna and a white Radharani, which had never been done before. Um, and Prabhupada wanted them installed as part of the panda program, which we did. And then also Tamal Krishna surprised us all by you know, taking sannyas. And um, at least he surprised me. I'm sure other people knew it was happening. But when he arrived and said, I'm taking sannyas and we're going to have the sannyas program right here at the Pondal, I was shocked. I said, what about Madri? That was his wife. So, but anyway, that's what happened for Jayapur. And I would visit Srila Prabhupada every day at the guest house and make sure he didn't need anything. And one day, as I'm walking up the steps to his um, room, I noticed the sky was filled with beautifully colored kites. Um, and so when I walked in his room, I told him about the kites and I asked him if he wanted to come outside and see because they're really beautiful. And he said, oh yes, it's kite flying season. And he reminisced and he said, when I was a boy growing up in Calcutta, I used to fly kites with my sister, but she was always better than me. Her kite would fly higher than mine, and so I was very angry about that. One day I decided to climb up to the roof and fly my kite from there, so my kite would fly higher than hers. And then she cried out, Govinda, 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 and then her kite flew higher than mine. <laughs> And he said, so you see, even in our childhood, we were always remembering Krishna. And he told me I could go fly a kite if I wanted to. <laughs> but I realized that by telling me the story, Srila Prabhupada was teaching me to always remember Krishna, even in the simplest of acts, like flying a kite or drinking water or feeling the warmth of the sun or being bathed in the light of the moon. So during the Jayapur festival, the Maharani of Jayapur offered to give us uh, invited us to her home, and I went with Shamasundar and Devananda Swami, and she offered to give us an old palace that was on the ground, city palace complex, right behind Radha Govindaji's temple. And the next day we toured it, and even though it was in pretty rough shape and needed a lot of renovation, Srila Prabhupada loved it. And so when Prabhupada left Jayapur, he asked me to stay along with Devananda Swami um, and an Indian devotee to finalize our agreement with the royal family. 
But so about a week before that was done, the Indian devotee left Jaipur for Mayapur, our first Mayapur festival. And Devananda and I, Devananda Swami and I stayed back trying to finalize our agreement, but ultimately it, her family would not allow her to give the palace, and so the deal fell through, and we headed to Mayapur. And because I had spent so much time with Devananda alone, by the time we arrived in Mayapur, we had become the subject of some very malicious gossip. So I went to Srila Prabhupada and I said, I felt very hurt that people were saying these things about me and that I wanted to just shave my head and move to Birnagar and, and live at Bhaktivinoda Thakur's women's ashram. And he said, and I said, I want to be alone. I want to find peace. I don't want any of this difficulty. I was complaining. Look what I have to tolerate. <laughs> and then he said, no, you may not go. I want you to stay here with me, you can cook for me, and I will protect you. But you must know that you are looking for a calm sea, and you will not find it here in this material world. When you are back home with Krishna, you will find it there. And he said, and then, he, he looked at me with this, his, he had a characteristic twinkle that was only, only he could do. And then he said, but you have a, excellent captain for this journey. So what is the difficulty? <laughs> His smile was so warm and so loving and so kind. He never once asked me if anything was true that was being said or what was being said. It didn't matter to him. He just wanted to take my pain away and he did. He took away my suffering. He trusted me. He asked me to trust him to guide, to trust him that, that he could guide me through my life. Because sometimes life is tough. And although it's been decades since he spoke those words to me, that's a lesson I'll carry with me to my grave. Because in life, there is no calm sea. There are the waves of happiness and distress and sadness and sickness and health and gain and loss and opulence and poverty. And, but with Srila Prabhupada as the captain of our ship, I think we can sail peacefully through this lifetime. So there's only one more memory I want to share with you because I know my time is short. And that is, I, I, as we were traveling around to India, Tamal, I remember Tamal went to ask Srila Prabhupada um, where he'd like to go next. And I'll remember this too. He said, I am just like a cow. I will give milk wherever you take me. <laughs> so I want to thank him for all the cream he's bestowed on us. His words and deeds will empower us through our lives and speak to our hearts forever. Jai Shri And on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank Koshali and Davy for doing such a beautiful job of telling us